Okay, so now I'd like to call on the CEO of Gold Coast Primary Health Network, Matt Caridus, to introduce the speakers. Sorry, thanks, Kelly. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, as Kelly said, my name is Matt Caridus. I'm the CEO of the Primary Health Network. Um, thank you very much for coming out this evening. I hope you're going to find it um, an educational experience. Obviously, um, my Medicare and voluntary patient registration has been a long time coming. And to some extent, from what we've heard from a lot of people, there's hasn't been a lot of information up to this point. So what we've been able to do is to pull together a panel of people this evening and we'll let you know as much as we know and you'll hear from our eminent guests and speakers who probably know more than I do about what this might mean for us. So there'll be plenty of opportunity to ask questions. Um, so we've got um, a, a couple of people this evening. Firstly, I'll, um, I'll very shortly introduce Simon Cottrell. Simon Cottrell is speaking on behalf of the Commonwealth Department of Health. Simon's the First Assistant Secretary for the Primary Care Division. So Simon is someone who's been heavily involved in the policy development at the Commonwealth level. We also have um, Dr Waleed Jamal here, who's a GP in Sydney. Waleed was a member of the Strengthening Medicare Task Force. So um, an absolute... Um, the, probably the, the expert in um, strengthening Medicare from a, a general practitioner perspective should be able to take and answer questions on a very wide range of issues around strengthening Medicare, and particularly around um, how it impacts on GPs and general practices. Um, and um, lastly, we have um, Dr. Lisa Beecham. So, Lisa, just put your hand up, Lisa. Um, Lisa is our board chair. So, Lisa will talk a little bit about how um, the PHN is going to support. Um, practices over the continuum. So this will be the first of a number of events as more information becomes available. We'll use all mediums at our disposal to get information out to GPs and practices as quickly as possible. So we hope to make the whole process as smooth as possible. So we'll have a number of these events and engagements over the next little while, bearing in mind that this process <coughs> won't be over and done with by Christmas. It'll be, this is going into next year um, and there'll be a range of new developments that will occur and that will come online as part of the Strength of the Medicare um, initiatives. So we'll be keeping people up to date and providing whatever assistance we can in that regard. So I'd now just like to welcome Simon. Simon, thank you very much for joining. Simon is joining us from Canberra. Um, Simon can only stay for a short period of time and then has to leave. He has other engagements on this evening. And we do have a couple of pre-prepared questions that people have sent in that we'll ask um, Simon before he goes. Unfortunately, we won't be able to take extensive questions because Simon must leave us shortly after he finishes. So I'll hand over to Simon. Thank you very much, Simon. Thanks so much, Matt. And I can't really see many people in the room, so um, apologies if, uh, if I'm not reading the room very well. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm speaking to you today from uh, Melbourne and Nambri country. I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners here uh, and pay, also pay my respects to the old, extend those to all uh, First Nations people. Um, so I've got some slides. They're really complicated, but they're probably a useful takeaway for, for you. So we'll just lift them up if we can. Um, and I will speak briefly to them and, and then uh, go to questions. So, uh, yeah, if we go to the uh, second slide, I hope. They're up there. Okay, the second slide, which has got uh, two tables of primary plan and strength and get task force support on it. Is that the one that's there? Um, so, so, the purpose of this, this slide is to emphasize to you that we've been on a four year journey um, to get here. Uh, we uh, primary health reform steering group um, to develop um, for the government a primary health care 10 year plan. Uh, it met, uh, well, the Kamal Linton um, co chaired that group, so uh, good, strong Queensland representation there uh, um, from, from Steve. Um, but that group uh, made a bunch of recommendations uh, to the Commonwealth government to inform a primary health care 10 year plan. Uh, the previous government adopted uh, that plan. Uh, the first thing to say is it, uh, it was based on the quadruple aim, which is um, a more framework in our system reform, in which we try to improve uh, people's experience of care, uh, 
population health outcomes, the cost efficiency of the health system, but also importantly the work life of health care providers. So uh, it's been repeatedly shown uh, that reforms don't succeed unless we're addressing all of those aims all together. Um, there are some very um, well thought through objectives uh, for the 10 year plan and series of recommendations will be turned into actions in three streams. Uh, one on future focused health care. Um, and the previous government uh, uh, will claim a uh, very first action on under the 10-year plan was the introduction of NBS telehealth during the pandemic, and I think it's important that we recognise that that's been um, a major addition uh, to how we fund uh, general practice uh, in this country. Um, the, the second stream was on persons and primary care supported by funding reform, and the major piece of that. Uh, related to recommending a system of voluntary patient registration, uh, which would provide a basis on which we could, um, over time, move to more blended funding approaches, not removing fee-for-service, but building on fee-for-service with additional incentives um, to promote patient-centred care. So that was uh, part of the original front health plan, and we'll come to how it's part of the uh, strengthening Medicare reforms. Um, and the third uh, stream of action was about integrating care, making sure that we've got uh, cultural change, but also the role of the prim uh, primary health networks in uh, helping uh, primary care to integrate local health systems, importantly hospitals, but also uh, the aged care system, disability care systems, broader, um, broader social support system. So, all in the 10 year plan still. Uh, when the government changed, they uh, agreed to continue to support the 10 year plan but established the Strengthening Medicare Task Force, on which Polly uh, and Steve were also represented um, with, a, with a range of stakeholder organisations and consumers and uh, Aboriginal uh, community control sector um, and, and a range of professional organisations um, to prioritise the actions in the 10 year plan. And so, what do we need to do first um, to get moving? Um, that uh, that task force recommended to the minister we go with the Queen Triple A, so we added equity um, as a very important aim um, of these reforms, so improving equity of access to care and outcomes from uh, care for all population groups. And then uh, the task force made a series of recommendations along the themes of increasing access, uh, encouraging multi disciplinary team based care, and as a bit more emphasis from the task force on that point than there had been uh, in the primary health care to community plan. Uh, Modernising primary care which was largely about the digital health agenda and supporting change management uh, and cultural change uh, in the healthcare sector. So um, I won't read through all their recommendations because the government responded to all of them uh, in, a, in an initial kind of way in the 2023-24 uh, budget. Next slide. Um, it's also very complicated. There were 29 measures um, in the 23-24 budget to respond to the Strength in Medicare Task Force report. Um, in, importantly, uh, the tripling of the above billion, billion incentive I think was intended to send two messages. One, that the government wants to invest in general practice and make sure it's sustainable. But two, that we, wanted, uh, we want to target uh, additional Thing, uh, to people who need it most. And you know, in the case of bulk building incentive, that is uh, children, uh, older people, and, uh, and people uh, who are disadvantaged because they're on low income. So um, that, that's where the bulk building incentive goes in terms of patients. Um, that, that measure will start in November. I'm not going to go through this list. You can take it away as a souvenir. Um, but if we can go to the next slide. Emphasise the 10, uh, 10 most important measures for um, general practice funding, which uh, you'll be interested in. So, uh, I've mentioned the tripling of the bulk of the incentive. There's a theme in the budget of supporting uh, longer consultations uh, with general practice. So, the next thing the government did was introduce uh, level B consultations, I think. Well, they're also starting in November. Um, uh, we're supporting long the uh, uh, telephone telehealth consultations, so level C and D, 
in the context of patients who are registered with the practice under my Medicare. And the logic of that is that there is evidence that uh, telephone telehealth uh, is of better quality if it's in the context of a continuity of care relationship. So that uh, that's the logic behind uh, that change. In addition, the triple bulk billing incentive will apply for level uh, C, E, telehealth. So there'll be a level E video conference um, item. So that's the first three measures um, we're implementing My Medicare, which is the system of voluntary patient registration. So that open the practice uh, practices to link their providers on the 1st of July. On the 1st of October, that will open for patients. Um, it will be, uh, uh, there'll be a requirement for the patient to have had two face-to-face -face visits with your practice uh, in the previous two years to demonstrate that they have a pattern of attendance at the practice and that will be enough for them to be able to register. Um, if a child registers with your practice, the parent can also register without meeting that um, eligibility requirement and vice versa. Um, and if they register, if they nominate um, a preferred GP and the, that GP shifts practices, the patients can move for GP without uh, any, any additional visits. Um, so that's the basis for the eligibility. There are some, there are some um, exceptions to that. So in uh, remote areas, in modified like one, eight, six, and seven areas, there'll only be a requirement for one visit uh, before you can register for some populations where it will also be allowed that. Um, so that opens on the 1st of um, October for patients. The general patient, the benefits to the patient are uh, access to those longer uh, telehealth items. Um, then next year, uh, we'll be making changes to the current aged care access incentive. And um, so rather than basing uh, that incentive on the volume of services provided in aged care um, and paying a SIP on that basis, uh, service incentive payment direct to GPs on that basis. Is performing that payment to become a general practice and aged care incentive. And the idea is that, um, that patients in residential aged care settings will uh, register with their preferred uh, doctor, and if that doctor provides uh, continuity of care for the patient through annual health assessments and like items, so uh, having, having had a concerted look at that patient's net needs, once a year, we've done um, some regular face-to-face -face visits. Uh, there'll be a $300 per patient payment paid in the same way as um, a SIP would be paid now, and $130 per patient to the practice um, to help support the arrangements. And we're doing final consultation on, on the detail of that incentive, um, but that will uh, start in August of next year. And it's important, um, if you're seeing uh, a and to regularly because you can be doing some of your annual health, health assessments and other items that will qualify for that patient um, uh, ahead of the commencement in August. Uh, the second new incentive that we're introducing uh, is called wraparound primary care for frequent hospital users, but we're shortening that to frequent hospital users uh, incentive and it will be uh, gradually scaled up over the next four years. It is so in the building detail co design, and then it will roll out um, across various primary health network regions over the remaining three years. And at peak, it will only it will have 14,000 uh, patients enrolled under it. So it's not a major um, it's, it's not a major incentive for every general practice. It will be quite specialised. Explain a bit of uh, the idea. The idea is that. Uh, 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 and who are attending emergency departments uh, frequently and who could be better cared for uh, in primary care settings. And then the primary health network uh, will work with general practices to identify suitable practice uh, for the patient to enrol with. And then there will be um, some facilitation payments uh, to, to assist the practice to care for that patient and, and some uh, outcome-based payments. Um, 
if the patient's attendance at hospital reduces. So we're working on the detail of that, but they're, they're, they're quite generous payments associated with that. Um, we want to make sure that we get who is paying the money right. So is it the individual doctor, is it the practice, is it a combination? Uh, what's that paying for? And then the uh, outcomes payment right. So are we rewarding the right uh, set of outcomes um, that, the, that the practice um, has some control over? So those are the two new incentives. Then we will be, uh, we're extending the current PIP quality improvement incentive for a year while we review the whole PIP and workforce incentive uh, program set of payments and develop a roadmap uh, for the coming 10 years about how we might introduce further new incentive uh, payments to support and uh, uh, for pocket most. And so the areas that we're thinking about are pretty well known. And so we're thinking about complex chronic disease patients. We're thinking about uh, patients in the, in the first two thousand days of life. Um, and we'll be targeting uh, the payments to disadvantage. So we are not heading towards capitation, we're heading towards incentivising uh, better care for patients who need it most. Um, so uh, our um, forward plan in relation to uh, my Medicare, and then the three main remaining things I wanted to talk about briefly, um, we will be doing a review of all the uh, after-hours programs supporting dental practice. So the, um, the PIP program, our arrangements with Health Direct for after-hours access, um, the uh, PHM after-hours program, uh, the uh, medical debt, uh, the sort of range to see if we can improve those. And we expect to uh, have an update on that in the next budget. The $143 million there is to extend the existing PHM after hours program and um, create two new programs uh, to support access for uh, people experiencing homelessness and for multicultural communities. And then uh, I hope you're aware uh, we boosted the workforce incentive program uh, um, at, at top level. The, the cap on the program has increased from $125,000 to $130,000 per practice, but more practices uh, will qualify for the top tier of that um, program, and more practices altogether will qualify for the program. Uh, and then finally, um, we're, we're starting a new commissioning program uh, for the primary health networks to assist small practices uh, with our. But if you're a small practice that doesn't have um, uh, enough uh, patients to support a decent uh, workforce incentive program payment or to support your own employment of practice nurses and allied health, the BHM um, will have some funding to assist um, in that situation. And they'll need to do uh, a needs assessment for the region and, and target to areas of greatest need. But um, at, at least that's the start of um, to make health. Uh, 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 by the PHM. So they're the main issues I wanted to uh, talk about. That's, that's the end of my slides. Um, that's a lot. Uh, Gold Coast PHM, please um, circulate the slides so that people have got um, that information to hand. Um, and I think I'm happy to take a, a few questions now. Yeah, great. Is that the plan? Yeah, that, that's it. Thanks, Simon. So the first question is, what what are the Commonwealth plans to inform consumers around the benefits and the registration process? Yeah. So we're going to start the communication to consumers close to the 1st of October because uh, we don't want consumers to be asking practices about registration before they're able to register. Um, so there'll be some broad-based communication, there'll be some social marketing communication, uh, there'll be materials in um, but it will start very close to the person of time. Okay, thanks. Simon. And the final question is, we've heard there'll be nine initial PHN regions prioritised to implement the frequent uh, hospital users incentive. So is that correct? We're staging it in the first nine, and um, can you advise us if the Gold Coast will be one of those? Uh, well, uh, we're expecting there to be one in each jurisdiction, and then there's a spare. Um, so, uh, 
There's some existing programs in, in other PHNs in Queensland that, uh, that might give them a bit of an edge. But if, um, you know, we, we have to roll it out uh, in, um, in this way uh, so that we learn as we go along. Okay, that's great. Um, thanks very much, Simon. We appreciate you giving us some of your time tonight. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. I think so. Sorry, but the audio was a bit scratchy at times. We're not um, getting great internet reception, as you probably know. Um, but we thought it would be really important to get um, an opinion and some advice and a little bit of information from the Department of Health. They're obviously the people who, as you could gather from the presentation, that have constructed the My, My Medicare system. So we thought it was really important for you to, um, to hear directly from them about what they think some of the initiatives are for and what benefits they think they'll derive. Okay, so that brings us to our, um, our, can I call it the keynote speaker for the evening? So we've got um, Dr. Wally Jamal, who I introduced to you earlier. Um, Wally, we're more than happy for you to please join us. And thank you. Wally has made the trip from Sydney, so thank you very much. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, well, so thank, thank you to Simon for that prelude because it sort of covers a lot of what I was going to cover so we can go <coughs> reasonably quickly um, through this. Um, the room is a bit bigger than I actually thought it was going to be and normally what I, and it's a bit scary actually, <laughs> uh, no, um, perhaps actually if I, if I can ask you to think just for like a 60, 60 seconds or 30 seconds if I asked you to think about the ideal practice in an ideal world and that you had an ideal practice in an ideal world, recognising we absolutely don't live in one right now, what would you like your patients to actually say about it? What are the characteristics of, the, uh, of that ideal practice that patients, that you'd like to hold up that patients would like to say about it? So just maybe think about it. If you want to yell out something, fine, but I just will plant that. I won't, normally I sort of, get feedback for a couple of minutes, but it's a bit bigger than, than I thought. So if you think about that, if you want to yell something out that comes to mind, please go ahead. So think of yourself as a patient. What would you like to say about your ideal practice in an ideal world? Accessible, Accessible. yep. So I want to see my doctor when it suits me. And I want to pay the bare minimum. <laughs> Let's call that affordable. Yeah. yeah, whatever that means. High quality care. They might know my name. Yeah. Anything else? So services, lo lots of services, under one roof if possible. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Unlimited consult time. Or just let's just talk about time. Time, yeah? Such, such an important asset. Yeah, okay. Look, um, we're probably running behind a little bit. I don't know if you can read this, but this was a whiteboard, um, just in case you thought we'd be ever replaced by artificial intelligence. This was a whiteboard outside of a coffee shop in Hobart last Monday as we were walking in to run a practice managers and GP workshop on system change and why we need to change. And this literally was out of the blue. And what it says um, is that apparently AI can, can do diagnostics as well as a doctor, but can it give condescending looks, examine you with frigid hands, get mad when you're one minute late and then make you wait 45 minutes? Um, so we ordered some coffee, my colleague and I who was with me, we ordered some coffee, waited till the coffee was made, took the coffee and then we told them we were doctors. <laughs> um, and they said, sorry, I said, no, you've just given me another slide, thank you. Um, so some of the things, whenever we talk to about, you know, the ideal, is these are the attributes of a high-performing health system, the attributes of a high-performing primary care system. The attributes that many systems around the world strive for as we speak, and I'd like to think that many attributes that we, I, as a GP with my team, strive to do 
albeit against the system that we work in, and we're hindered by the system that we work in. It also turns out this is exactly what the government wants. And as Simon said, I've had the privilege, probably had more hair in my head when I started, but the privilege of being involved with discussions around a 10-year plan, the Strengthening Medicare Task Force, for many, many years. And it comes down to all of those things, and you can divide them up into, I know it's a bit hard to read, but about access, and not just access, but equitable access, comprehensive care, however, however you define that, continuity of care. So one point I'd like to make is that the, ideally you want to achieve all of these things together. It's not an or. Okay, because sometimes we can set up systems that will actually provide access but disintegrate continuity of care. Team-based care, coordination care, patient-centeredness and equity whilst we're at it. And the literature talks about if you build system to provide equity, it'll work for anyone. The Strength in Medicare Task Force, Simon's talked about. But we took all of those themes and talked about four different lots of different recommendations which are on Simon's slide divided up into four themes. These were interesting meetings. I've never been in meetings chaired by a health minister before. Six meetings over six months. And he tested us, the whole lot of us, about giving him the right, and, uh, the, the right words and the, and the impetus to actually make change so he can go back to his cabinet and make change. And what he says now is that this is now foundational. This budget is the foundation of many to come. It's absolutely not going to happen overnight. This is like Simon's slide, but uh, somewhat different. This is my opinion of what the most relevant things in the budget are. I'm not going to go through every single one of them, but let me talk about, because Simon's already done it, let me talk about um, better digital. Rightly or wrongly, the focus is on the My Health Record. We recognize, the task force absolutely recognise that it's more than the My Health Record, that the health system needs to be interconnected, that patients, and in fact, I like to say that actually everything known about patients should be known by the patients. This is the future to health record and information transfer. And so, but, but in terms of better digital, in the budget, and I've heard the minister say publicly, we are moving towards a system of sharing by default. I estimate, and this is my guess, I don't know, I'm not, I don't work for the government, but my guess is that within the 12, next 12 months, all pathology and radiology results will have to be uploaded to the My Health Record. And I use the word have to be, unless the patient says no. That's been on the cards for years. I don't know what we've been doing, what that they've been doing in the pathology and radiology industry. So just think of the power of information transfer and, and accessibility. Think of how often you spend chasing results when it can all be on the My Health record. Um, Simon's talk about level E consult, he's talk about all of these things. There's some stuff here that probably more detail in Simon's big slide on the budget. One thing is that there's a six minute floor on level B. As you know in the item descriptor level B, um, there is no minimum time, there will be. And that comes out of the MBS task force recommendations back in 2020 or 2019. And then of course, there's my Medicare, which to me, I would have put it at the top, but triple bulk bill incentive stole the limelight. Um, triple buckle incentive Simon's talked about. This is a little bit more detail that, that I have checked that I can talk about. Um, anything I say tonight is as valid as of tonight. As you know, governments can change things. It might change tomorrow, okay? But it will apply to all face-to-face -face consultations, right? The, le the triple buckle incentive for those eligible patients. We're talking about pension card holders, healthcare card holders, Commonwealth senior card holders kids under 16, so not the whole population. 11.6 million people according to the budget. Nevertheless, it'll apply all face-to-face -face consultation more than six, min six minutes, that is not level A. So it will not apply to level A. It'll apply to all level B telehealth consults, irrespective of registration. 
However, the triple bulk bill incentive for telehealth, that is video or phone, that is more than 20 minutes, will only apply for patients who are registered. If they're not registered, you'll still get a bulk bill incentive, but it'll be multiple of one, not three. <coughs> Registration is about continuity of care. Why is continuity of care so important? Well, the literature talks about continuity of care, reducing hospitalizations, reducing ED visits, and reducing mortality. Think of continuity of care as a continuity of relationship. There are many aspects of continuity of care, but that seems to be the most important. And that's what people want. They want that continuity of relationship. That's why, despite frigid hands and perceived grumpiness on our behalf, we should not be replaced by AI if we value the relationship. That's what we do. It, it provides, acts, you know, continuity embeds the role of, um, you know, it, of the GP and primary care into the health system. How many times have patients walked into your rooms, sat down with the GP or practice nurse, and said, as you can see, doctor, I was in hospital last week and the, blood, and the specialist ordered a blood test. They'll be there on your computer somewhere. How many times has that happened? And you have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. It will it will provide the system and structure to embed reform and it will provide a structure for blended funding on top of the MBS. This is just a couple of slides on, we have the, on the fact that we have Australian data that talks about and, and uses proxy for continuity. In New South Wales, <coughs> we have Lumos. Sorry, I've been talking so much in the last week, I've got a cracky voice. Um, in <coughs> New South Wales, we have LUMOS. Um, LUMOS is a system where we basically, it sucks out our entire database after it's been de-identified on site. It then links it to hospital data, cancer registry, ED, ambulance, private hospital, public hospital, mortality, births, etc. So you get <coughs> a report back providing you a de-identified report on exactly what's happened to your entire practice database. What was noticed in 2019 for a population of a million patients is that some practices <coughs> were marked as high connectivity, which means that for 30% or more of their practices, of their patients, they did 12 or more visits in two years. I, for example, <coughs> let's say we have 10,000 patients. That's over 3,000 patients we're seeing 12 times a year uh, in two years or more. That's a lot of activity. And from the MBS perspective, you can think, say that we're over-servicing. Four-fifths of practices were in that group. Uh, in one, uh, one fifth of practices were in that group. Four-fifths were not. What was noticed is that the practices who were high connectivity had 10% chance less of ED and 12% less chance of hospitalization for the entire database, not just the 3,000. This is the cost benefit and cost effective analysis using economic modeling on that. For every dollar spent on the MBS in those practices, there was a dollar 60 saved in the health system. This, and look at the cost effectiveness for kids, $3.24. The cost benefit, $3.24. This sort of economic modelling is what is making national cabinet and cabinets in around all states take note that we make a difference. We kind of knew it, but now we've got proof. This is also proof that for patients who had an unplanned hospital admission, we're talking about a cohort of three million people Unplanned hospital admission, if we see them within two days of discharge, there's a 33% reduction in readmission rate in the first week and more in the first month. Why do patients leave hospital without an appointment with their GP? They're given an appointment with the orthopaedic surgeon, they're given an appointment with the outpatient department, they're given an appointment with everybody else, and hand a discharge summary and say, 
go make your own appointment for GPs. That should not be allowed to happen. <coughs> so patient registration is about that. It's about continuity of care. It's about, this is from the budget, <coughs> it's about comprehensive information for regular patients at the practice at whom, with whom they're registered. And it's about additional funding packages. <coughs> I think I've, Simon's touched on all of this. That's what the, the themes are around continuity and registration. It's to enable and formalise the relationship between a GP and their patients and their practice and their patients. The patients that call them their practice. It is not <coughs> capitation. This is the definition, this is just one of many definitions of capitation on the slide. You certainly get the slide. But it is not capitation. It is a mechanism to blend funding on top of the MBS. The MBS is not going anywhere. We are so far down the Medicare MBS culture in this country, nothing that I've heard over the last 10 years talks about capitation at any government level that I've had the privilege to discuss. Oh, by the way, it is not voluntary patient restriction. A registered patient can still go to any practice at any time. <coughs> so how it will work? You have to be on the organisation register. Your providers who wish to take part need to be linked to the organisation register. Hands up if you've got registrars in your practice. You're already on the organisation register. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been paid for your registrar. That part's done. You go in, pick up the site tab, pick up the providers tab, check with your doctors before you do, just check with them, and link their provider number, and you're done. That's all you've got to do between now and 1 October. If you're not an organisation register, good luck. <coughs> it, does, it is a little bit of fiddly work, let me tell you. As Simon said, to be eligible to register a patient needs to have been to the practice twice in the last two years. Anyone could have seen them in the practice. That could be twice last week, it could be twice last December, it could be once last week, once last December. It doesn't matter. The other thing, as Simon said, <laughs> Simon said, <laughs> tell him you said that. <coughs> Simon says, um, the other thing that he said was that if a parent has been, the kids are eligible. If the kids have been, the parents are eligible. And I think, don't quote me, please don't quote me, but I think it's linked to the Medicare number on the card. So that if one partner has been to one practice, another partner has been to another practice, and the kids have been to a third practice, all of them have the choice of registering with any of those three practices. Some lower requirements for MM6 and Archos and AMSs. Registered, the registered practice and GP will be visible on the My Health record. Hopefully, when everybody wakes up to the My Health record, no known GP should no, long, lo no longer be an option. I can talk about the specifics of registration. I'm probably over time already. We'll leave some questions. Um, <coughs> do you want me to talk about some of the, the how patients can register? Again, this could change, so please don't quote me. But it goes something like this. The fundamental basic principle is bilateral consent. What that means is patients will go on to the My Medicare tab in the Medicare app on their phone or in Medicare online. Please don't tell them to do that yet. It doesn't exist. That's what Simon was going about. Do not market this to your patients. They'll, it'll create mayhem. Wait till 1 October. Anyway, patients will go and they will be able to see, <coughs> should they choose to register, only the practices that they're eligible to register with. Right? Based on the filter that I just talked about. They fill in some information, some of which is compulsory, some of which is not, and they press apply. 
the practice gets a message through prada. Yes, it's through prada. Just breathe, right? That a patient has asked to register. You go into prada and you accept or you deny. Only then are they registered. The flip side of that is that you can go find your patients in the Medicare system on Proda, send them a message to invite them to register. They get a message in whatever system they're using and they accept or they deny. And the third and last way is a manual consent form which will be determined by the government. I'm pushing it to be only one page. We'll see what they come up with and which you can fill in on site and then do the back end registration in the office in Proda. Ideally, in an ideal world, and I'm pushing for this ideal world, we shouldn't have to enter Proda. Our software, through back end authentication, should be able to suck that information in and out. Hold, don't hold your breath, but let's, let's push for that as quickly as possible. So, <coughs> 1 October, patients can register. What's in it? Nothing. 1 November, level C and D for telephone items, which you've just been told about, and the triple block bill incentive. Mid next year, Simon's already talked about the aged care SIP. He's talked about the hospital frequent flyers. It's there on, f on the slide for you to read later. From November 24, chronic disease item numbers will be restructured in accordance with the MBS task force, not the Strengthening Medicare task force, the MBS task force recommendations of 2019. At that point, <coughs> a registered patient will only have the, have, sorry, let me start again. At that point, if a patient's registered, only that practice and any provider in the practice can have access to the chronic disease management. If the patient's not registered, any practice can do it, right? It will be restructured. I can talk more about that later if you wish. But essentially, if all of these things, and there's a lot of work to do between now and then, if all of what we ask for actually happens, there will be no more team care arrangements, no more fax backs, no more paperwork. Nurses, you can breathe, right? No more red tape. Having a care plan means you're eligible to a referral for an allied health. But the value of the care plan will drop a little bit. The money is in the reviews. Reviews will go up to be equal to the care plan. So that if you do a care plan and two or three reviews over a year, you get the same amount of money anyway as you do now. S the idea, and this is very much my personal opinion, I'm happy to criti be criticised over it. The idea that you can do a 721, 723 on the same day, <coughs> pocket $260 if you block bill and never see the patient again needs to go. That is not chronic disease management. So in the future, the idea is that you have the Medicare system, we have blended funding supporting and block funding supporting cohorts of patients. That's the vision for the future. This cohort gets this, this cohort gets this, this cohort gets this, with the backbone being patient registration. Patient registration in of itself is not a funding mechanism. Hence, that is why there is no payment for registration. So what now? It's up to you to think. By the way, there is no hurry. Please do not try and enrol. Sh I shouldn't use the word enrol. I should use the word register. Patients don't like the word enrol. Don't try and register all of your patients on 1 October. You and your staff will have a nervous breakdown. Just don't. It's okay. Breathe. Take your time. This is, as the minister has said publicly, laying the foundation bit by bit. But get yourself organised, have a think about what you want to do, who would you like to talk to about, what does your practice look like, what's your data look like, what's your pitch to your patients, what's your pitch about what you can offer them. 
I get asked, you know, shall we wait? Sure, you can wait as long as you like. We, as in my practice, have decided we're not waiting to November 24 and finding that 70% of our patients are enrolled elsewhere by then. We're not waiting for that. But we're not in no hurry either. That's the workforce incentive. You can have the slide. We can talk more about it later. <coughs> the future is multidisciplinary team-based care wrapped around the patient with the GP as a central figure, okay? The future is general practice at the centre of the health system. The problem we have now <coughs> is that right now we have a patient and we have a GP and we've got an MBS item number. No one else gets paid until the GP gets paid. Nothing else can happen. We need this with the patient at the middle, with the GP at the top, forgive me for non-GPs, I will put the GP at the top, as the conductor of the team. The GP, uh, I, I me, mean, should not lose a cent. In fact, we should be paid a lot more. But so should everybody else. We therefore we need the MBS, we need block funding, we need bundle payments, we need collaborative commissioning payments, we need payments from the hospital system, we need payments by PHNs <coughs> to determine the core and extended team that requires that is required to wrap around care for our patients. And when I say our patients, I'm talking about our registered patients, our formalised registered patients who call us their GP and their doctor. I was going to go through a case vignette, but I won't. We can, we can talk about that later. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Waleed. And again, um, Waleed came up from Sydney to present tonight, so thank you very much for his attendance here. And obviously the reason why we invited Waleed is it's just so important to have someone who's been on this two or three year journey to explain in depth about the background and how the Medicare reforms have come about. Um, Lisa Beecham, can I now introduce Lisa Beecham? If you haven't met Lisa, Lisa is a GP on the Gold Coast, long-standing GP, and Lisa is the chair of the board of the Gold Coast Primary Health Network, who's going to talk to you a little bit about some of these services and assistance we'll be offering over the next little while. Thanks, Lisa. Wow, it's amazing to see such a big turnout. So thank you all for giving up your evening and coming along to learn about the My Medicare and Strengthening Medi Medicare uh, initiatives. I am excited. I do think that it's the first time in the last few years that we've seen an investment in general practice and our multidisciplinary teams in primary care. And you know, we've always been committed on the Gold Coast to being an innovative PHN, to striving for collaborative care, for striving for integrated care. But some of the MBS models have uh, limited our ability to roll that out. One of my previous roles was as a CQI, GP engagement officer, visiting your practice and showcasing data and doing some CQI activities in general practice. And I was always frustrated by the levers that existed with the MBS, that you know, the quicker you saw the patients, the more you earned, um, and there was no funding for that wraparound care for our chronic complex patients. And I will just outline one little case vignette. And you know, it always strikes me that this patient was really important. He happened to be my neighbour. I happened to see him with a registrar and my registrar said, oh my God, this guy's got really bad COPD. He's given me permission to talk about his case. Um, and he used to float around general practices and never have one general practice. Would determine where he went, A, by cost, B, by ease of getting in. He wanted to be seen straight away when he wanted to. Um, and he was a bloke. He didn't really want to take much time dealing with his health care. Um, and so this registrar managed to work him up get a great care plan for a COPD, wrap around all his care for action management for the COPD, convince him to get immunisations. He'd never had immunisations done. What are they for? He wasn't on anything much for medications. He'd never had a medication review. He didn't know how to use his medications even. His primary goal and the motivating force for his healthcare journey 
was to get him back to New Zealand because he realised his days were numbered and he realised that he wanted to get his wife home to be near the family. So that's what motivated him to work on his care. He accepted his flu shots, he accepted COPD management, he accepted uh, even pulmonary rehab. And uh, he managed to get his goal and get back, despite having had three or four admissions and looking like he wasn't going to make it before he started that journey. So I think this is a journey we're going on. And as GPs, we're always committed to delivering our best quality primary care. And I do believe that these initiatives will help us. The PHN's committed to helping us on this journey and trying to develop tools and develop patient communication strategies and to develop the governance around this. We're really fortunate at our PHN that we have three GPs on the board and that's one of the highest contingents of GPs on PHN boards around the country. So I'll call out KK. Um, she's another fellow GP on the board. Myself and Roger Halliwell, my predecessor as chair, who you would have known throughout the pandemic. And I think the pandemic really showed what we could do as a PHN, communicating changes, developing tools and tricks for the COVID immunisation rollout program, developing um, data extraction tools to find those highest risk patients throughout the pandemic. As you know, Primary Sense was developed here on the Gold Coast through an innovation grant from the Department of Health and it's been rolled out nationally to uh, 11 PHNs out of the 32 PHNs. Uh, and it really is something that's designed to assist GPs with that point of care, quality translation of evidence into practice. We all know we should do urine ACRs for our diabetics, right? But only 20% were getting done. And we've shown with the primary sense tool on your desktop, we've seen a significant improvement. Same with immunizations. We all know we should do flu shots for our cardiac patients and our COPD patients. And we can prove that having primary sense on your desktop uplifted by 30% during the pandemic when we're all at our most busy. So it really is that showcase of innovative ideas, PHN developing things that can assist throughout a period of change and help practices to navigate the change that we are about to face. I want to call out GPGC. We've got Tam in the audience. <laughs> Tam's the chair of GPGC. And our three member organisations are GPGC, made up of GP members and primary care staff, Gold Coast City Council, and PCPC represented by, um, uh, by an NGO nursing organisation. So we have strong members that really inform our direction. We have a community council that really does give us the community perspective. When we first floated the idea of patient registration, our community council initially was quite reluctant to think about the idea. But I think you know, it's up to us as doctors and MDT teams to really showcase to our patients the evidence for reducing morbidity and mortality by having one practice that you mainly go to for most of your healthcare needs. Um, we've already gone over the specifics that we know at this stage. So I won't reiterate what's already been uh, spoken to by Dr. Walid Jamil tonight and Simon Cotterell. We know there's gonna be more information to come and there's going to be more details that will be emerging over the next few years. And this is just the start of the investment process. I'm always contactable via the PHN and via my board chair. PHN email, so if you have any input, any ideas, any questions, I'm happy to be contacted and be able to help feed that up the channel. Matt and I will have a meeting at the end of September with all the national PHNs and CEOs to try and help move this forward and to be able to progress it and make it useful and make it doable and make it patient focused. We've got the uh, new nursing item numbers that will be rolling out and that will be important to uh, get on board for that for next year in August 2024. So we've established the Strengthening Medicare Advisory Committee, which is sitting here at the table. Um, and you'll be able to ask questions later from the panel. I think that gives us a really broad depth of uh, uh, healthcare representatives on the Gold Coast that are able to inform our journey and be able to make sure that it is practical, practical and general practice focused. Primary Sense, as we know, is the digital tool that can already help us pull out our most likely patients to go to hospital. It's evidence-based from the John Hopkins ACG tool. 
It's been in 25 uh, countries for about 20 years. And it has that high level evidence to give us the confidence to know that we are able to pick out our patients most likely to go to hospital, download reports on our desktop that are doctor specific or practice specific. We can cut and dice it. We can send SMSs to our patients that are due items of care like GP management plans or medication reviews. We can use that to inform our frailty scores. We've had a project underway at the moment trying to identify our patients that are highest frailty risk, that are more likely to go to hospital, more likely to be admitted for long periods of time, which was one of the Gold Coast Hospital Health Service's main bed blocks this year. And being able to identify those patients, being able to work on that group, and being able to wrap care around them, we should be able to stop that trajectory to um, long hospital stays. They'd be an ideal point to start with, with your patient registration journey and the category five and category four patients on primary sense. We've got advisory groups, as I said before, the community council, the clinical council, um, we've got the PIC committee, um, and we will be continuing to roll out information through the email group and through the website itself and through GPGC's Facebook um, site as well to GPs. We have resources that are underway to work on the CQI activities that will help to wrap around um, resources for the My Medicare rollout. Uh, that means that the practice could use those resources for PIP CQI activities or for the doctors for CPD activities as well as an added incentive to get on board and to be able to utilise those resources. As soon as they're available, we will announce it in the newsletter and we do hope that that will be available in the next few weeks. So I will pass over for the question and answer session. I'll pass over to Kelly. <laughs> everyone. If I can invite the panel just to move over here so that you can face the audience as, as questions are being asked, that would be excellent. Thank you. So um, you've already been introduced to Dr. Waleed Jamal and, and Dr. Lisa Beecham and joining them are the members of the Gold Coast Primary Health Network's Strengthening Medicare Advisory Group. So we've got um, Jason Keeley who is a local pharmacist and he's representing the Ally Health, Ally, Allied Health View tonight. We've also got uh, Elizabeth McRae, who is a member of our Community Advisory Council. We have Anthea Blower, who is a practice manager at one of our local practices. And Dr. Michael Piercy, a local GP. And Dr. Tamara Warby, who was also introduced, who is also the board chair for General Practice Gold Coast. So thank you to our esteemed panel. Now we did ask, um, as people were registering to uh, identify any questions that they had. So uh, we've got quite a few of those that we'll kick off with, but we'll also be taking questions from the audience. Now, some of the content may have already been covered, but because the questions have been asked, sometimes very pointedly, we'll um, be presenting some of those uh, to the panel, even if we may have covered some of that content already. Okay, so the first question, um, Waleed, and it has been covered to a certain extent, but will patients have to register with general practitioner uh, at a general practitioner level, or will they be able to just choose a general practice if they want to? I thought I'd sit in the corner and no one would ask me a question, but <laughs> that didn't work. Um, okay, so so it's completely voluntary to register at all. So patients don't have to register at all. However, the, think of the umbrella of registration as registration with a practice, given the filter for eligibility that we talked about earlier, and then they nominate a lead GP. Think of the lead GP as the usual GP in best practice or medical director or whatever software you're using. So the the, the registration is with the practice in the Medicare system first, the site, and then they nominate a lead GP. Do they have to do this at all? The answer is no. Can they register for a site without a lead GP? I don't know the answer to that question. I'm sorry. 
Thank you. And I think that's important to note that given, as many people have said tonight, this is a longer journey, there are still some unknowns. We may not know all the answers, even our esteemed panel may not have all the answers tonight, but we are taking notes and we'll be continuing to provide information to the broader general practice community as some more of this information becomes available. So, so if I can add, you can't register with a GP without registering with a site, right? So the site is first, GP second. Um, that's because it's subject to accreditation. It's not the individual GP that is accredited, it's the practice. And that's how the filter will be. And probably just building on that, Dr. Uh, Dr. Jamal, what's the eligibility criteria for a general practice to register for my Medicare? <coughs> so you have to be um, accredited or working towards accreditation. There is a moratorium Anyway, some detail will come. I think Simon's slides may have had uh, had some detail. Um, but there's a moratorium for certain services that outreach um, to aged care, to homelessness, homeless people um, and disability support. Um, but as a general rule, you need to be accredited or working towards accreditation with some exceptions, the details of which will come in time. Thank you. Um, what are the registration processes for GPs that work in more than one practice? Anthea, can we throw that to you? Um, basically, it will be provider number linked. So, so long as the patient, or the doctor has a provider number that you have linked in your practice when you've registered your practice, then that's how it will all work together. So. It doesn't really matter if the doctor works in multiple locations. As doctor just said, it's practice first. When they're choosing your practice, then they pick the doctor. So even if they, if you, so again, the patient registers, say with Smith Street Medical Centre, that's their first point. They want to see Dr. Jones at Smith Street Medical Centre. Even if Dr. Jones works at another practice, their main care is at Smith Street. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, so we've heard a lot from GPs tonight and obviously GPs are central to these reforms, but wanting to get a bit of a view from an allied health perspective about what the potential benefits that, that you see, Jason. <coughs> Thanks for having me here tonight. Um, yeah, basically I think anything that's really uh, promoting a system of patient-centric care is a really good idea. Um, <coughs> with regards to, um, for my, as a, myself as a professional, um, as a pharmacist and I work after hours and, and I quite often see a lot of patients that um, are either from interstate or elsewhere. Um, if I need to actually, actually access some of their healthcare records and healthcare information, especially by the, through the My Healthcare and My Health Records, um, I always find it difficult, they're always, um, not very complete or there's only partial information there. So I guess um, as part of a system that's you know, integrating that My Health record more will actually make it easier for Allied Health to access patient information at, you know, at their request. Um, also, um, I feel that uh, by having a patient-centred care model, um, the GPs would be more likely to be referring to their Allied Health and making sure that you know, from a pharmacy perspective, making sure that they're getting their um, home medicine reviews or medication checks done, um, if they're eligible for Webster, patient, uh, Webster packs and stuff like that. Um, also having that continuity of care once they've come out of the hospital um, so that they're referred into the community pharmacy if they've had medication changes or large changes to their, their therapy. Thank you. And Elizabeth, as the consumer um, on the panel tonight, what, are, what do you see as the benefits and what are still some concerns that you have? Um, well, thank you for having me here tonight. We did discuss this topic at one of our um, advisory council meetings and there was a little bit of fear initially amongst the members because uh, this is something new and something different. So I think you might have some patients coming along to you that will need to be encouraged and supported to, to sign up and, and join. But on the whole, everyone thought um, that it was a good idea that they would have the chronic conditions managed. Um, everyone can see the benefit of having you know one GP and the continuity of care. 
um, people get, get a little frustrated sometimes um, if they have been in hospital and come out and their GP isn't aware of what's been going on. So if, if as we heard earlier, if, the, if this is going to change, that could only be a benefit. Um, patients were, uh, people were a little bit concerned that um, if they couldn't get in to see the GP they were registered with, um, would another practice see them? So I think that's something that people need to be educated about. Um, but on the whole, everyone was um, quite positive by the end of the discussion. Thank, thank you. So, um, and probably just following on from that, um, is it only the registered GP that will be able to claim for items such as the long telehealth consult, or would any um, GP within that practice be able to make that claim? Any GP. Any GP. Okay, um, there's still a few of the pre-prepared questions, but I might throw it over to the audience now and just see if there's any particular issues that you have for the panel members. Yes? So the question is, if there's a GP and they have a number of patients who are registered with them and they move practices, what in practicality happens? Do the patients follow the GP automatically? Sure. <coughs> So I, I'd sort of maybe get back to you by asking you a question, what happens now? Right. So when a GP leaves and they've got a load of patients, um, some of those patients will never come back. Some of those patients will go elsewhere. Some of those patients will follow the GP if they find out where the GP's gone. And many of those patients will stay with the practice and start seeing somebody else. That's exactly what will happen under my Medicare. What Simon said, though, um, I keep saying Simon said, it sounds so funny. <laughs> <laughs> I really have to tell him. Um, what Simon pointed out um, was that, and I didn't know this until this week, actually, um, is that when a GP leaves and goes to another practice, the patient can follow and register with them from the word go. They do not have to f um, fulfil the two visits in two years face-to-face filter requirement. I didn't know that, I was saying the other, other way, that they have to go twice first before they can register, but that's not true. So when a GP moves practice, their patients can follow and re-register instantly, even though they may have never been to that practice before. Okay, another question? Yeah, I just want to know if a patient wants to change the GP, they register one practice and they suddenly find the other practice better. If they want to change, and what's the process? Can they deregister with one doctor and go to the other? Or? Yep, so if a patient is seeing, is registered with one practice and decides suddenly that they want to change practices, what's the process that will be needed? They can change. They go online, they remove that one, and they find the other practice that they want to register with. Remembering that they can't register with any practice, at any, like they can't see, they can only see or choose practices that the Medicare system tells them that they're eligible for based on the filters and requirements that I pointed out earlier. So if they've been to another practice and they want to move, they can move, just like that. C can I be greedy and ask two questions? So the first one was, um, Ha what happens, a lot of these patients, people who are going to most benefit are the people who are not computer literate, are going online. Will there be lots of support for them? That was question one. And question two was, I'm in a practice where a lot of people are convinced this is capitation by stealth and won't sign up. Can just one or two GPs in a practice sign up? Sorry to ask you two questions. So the second, <laughs> so, so the first question, the first question was, what will there support for people who aren't computer literate and IT savvy? The answer is, it's it, it's a man, it turns into a manual process. Um, it will have to be at the practice. Um, it can be on an iPad in the waiting room that you, someone sits with them and helps them fill it out, or it could be on paper. They then have to sign a consent form because the consent digitally is digital, right? but the consent on paper is a signed form. I'm hoping it's one page, as I said earlier, <laughs> and not complicated. We'll wait, have to wait and see. Um, but then the manual bit is at the 
like you, you guys, the, the practice has to do the hard work. And that is, they have to go onto Proto, breathe, <laughs> um, breathe some more, and then f literally manually fill out all of those questions that the patient would have answered themselves had they done it themselves. So that's that bit. Absolutely, and, and I'm sure it's going to be in multiple languages and et cetera, et cetera. Time, right, over time, hopefully from as soon as possible. The second question is, yeah, that, sure. Um, look, I respect that. I'm not going to argue. We can be here all night arguing why this is not capitation. Um, I, I'm trying to find, I've been talking to a lot of practices and forums, and I'm trying to find the right balance between pragmatism and, and fear, not to instill fear. But here's my opinion for what it's worth. This is definitely my, just my opinion. The world is changing. We have four forms of care that we provide as general practitioners in things. We have chronic disease management. We do that really well. We have urgent care. Apparently, according to the states and Commonwealth, we don't do that very well. So they're setting up urgent care clinics. Then we have mental health care. We do that as a bread and butter, but yet still not enough. And we have lots of centres, state and Commonwealth, set around providing urgent or non-urgent mental health care. And then we have convenient care. The care that patients want at the time that they want, day or night. Something quick, something simple. Why would the owner of Bunnings spend $135 million buying a telehealth company that doesn't attract a single dollar of the MBS? Why would Woolworths spend almost as much on another telehealth company? In the United States of America, um, I, I found a, someone, a colleague who was here last week from Boston just sent me an article this morning saying that fuel companies, fuel companies, you know, Ampol and the likes, the US equivalent, have gone into walk-in centres to provide convenient, on-the-spot care. Um, the day that one of our colleagues goes to Bunnings and sets up a four-walled practice near the aisle 57, and another one sets up a four-walled practice near the health food shop section of Woolworths, general practice as we know it is going to change. So, I know I'm being paranoid, delusional and somewhat dramatic. I did take my medication today. <laughs> but the world is changing and I don't want to wait for that. I want to embed the role of general practice in the health system once and, once and for all. That's what I want. Thanks. Dr. Piercy? I'd just like to add to that. You know, you've seen all the ads for instant script on television. It's like we're going to be pushed out of the market. So, so Bunnings, West Bunnings, now own instant script. And if you haven't, if you haven't seen the website, go and have a look. Just go and have a look. Okay, well given that the world is changing in multiple ways and in particular thinking about the, the, the My Medicare that's fast approaching, what should general practices and GPs be doing now to be prepared for, for the next steps in what's coming with patient registration? I might throw this question to our, our local GPs. Um, Lisa? I would say make sure you are enrolled to the PHN email list. I say that to all my registrars and new doctors that have joined, if you're not getting those emails, just make sure you are enrolled because that's where the information will be flagged each week. Make sure you're a member of GPGC. If you're a GP, it's free and you can join the Facebook group and the website. Um, make sure that you are just staying up to date with the news as it comes to hand. I guess, you know, it's about thinking about what is your sell to your patients and, you know, it's interesting, isn't it, that we've got all these instant scripts and things like that popping up. My partner in Brisbane goes to a private clinic in Brisbane and they've set up a, a private version of this from what I can understand. So they're paying a registration fee each month to be on the books. 
that will give you instant script-like access and instant medical certificate-like access with your guaranteed doctor or if they're on leave, one of their other doctors in the practice. Um, so it's interesting, you know, we have to all move with the times and we have to move with, you know, modern medicine as it is, but we have to also be informed by best quality um, care. And we know that the best quality care is in general practice with a continuity of care, reduces morbidity and mortality. Tamara? Yeah, and the other things that you can start to look at is that when um, everyone is coming into the practice and you do the, the reception is doing their three identifiers, they can also just um, check that the usual doctor field is up to date um, because that's a way that you can do a lot of searches for your own practice, um, uh, like the people that you have on your panel basically as a doctor and you can start to search who meets the criteria for this, like who's in the last two years had two visits with that person as a usual doctor and you can start to think about how you might communicate with those people going forward with the registration process. Yeah, I forgot to mention Primary Sense is an excellent tool and you should all have it for free on your desktop if you choose to, choose to sign up with that program. And you can search the reports by putting in your own name so you can find out as a GP who your patients are in each of those reports. And again, that's another way of being able to think about getting ready for the process. Michael? Also, uh, programs like Hot Doc will give you an option to register interest to um, when, it, when it becomes live to be able to assist you in registering, so and assisting the patients to register as well. Excellent. And, and Thea, did you have anything to add? Um, I think for me it's about making sure that every patient experience that we have now is the most positive and engaged pa experience that they can have. We do pride ourselves on, on being customer service, especially, you know, reception teams. They are equally as important to this as the doctors are. We need to make sure that why is that patient going to choose our practice? And it's going to be because they're going to have positive experiences when they come. So it, that's the work that we've got to start now is just making sure everybody's on the same page, everybody's excited about this, this is not the end of the world, everybody is actually really a positive experience that can have the potential to, to make it really, really good outcomes for patients and actually improve the way we work. There can be lots of positivity if we're given time in our own practices to concentrate on the businesses of our practices as well as actually delivering care and it's not just throughput all the time. It's what you all want to do. So that's really good. Excellent. Back over to the audience. Some more questions. I was just going to ask about, um, you mentioned that when a patient registers with a practice and their GP leaves, you can follow them and you don't require the two-year face-to-face visits. So if they get a care plan done at the previous practice, can they get a new care plan done? With, does it ha is it still time-framed like it is now? Don't know. A lot of work is before it's tied. R right now, there is, as you know, and I, I'm not sure whether that will change. That's probably something that will be looked at before November. We're talking November 24, so a long way to go. Um, just a note: it's two visits in two years, not, not two years. You don't have to have been going to that practice for two years to be eligible. You could have been two visits two days apart, and you can register. Right, so twice in the last two years. It could have been twice in January 2022. You're still eligible now, right? Yeah, that unfortunately will knock out a lot of our young women who come every five years now for a pap smear. They don't have to come for anything else. They won't ever be eligible. So, so yes. Um, bear in mind now, now that it's, it's actually some looseness around the family. Yeah, but these are single women. Sure. So if a single woman has been once in two years only or once in five years, yeah. um, yes, that, that's correct. There is no eligibility at this point. That sucks. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> yep, we have another question here. Um, 
sorry, I've got, again, um, I've just got two questions, unfortunately. Um, my first one is, um, when the funding comes down from the government to the practice, is there going to be any guideline as to how the funding is going to be distributed by the practice to the GPs involved? Which funding? Uh, when we're talking about the block funding, for example. Sure. So, <coughs> the specific bits of funding that are tied to registration are as follows at this point, and obviously this can change over time, over time, right, over years. Sure. sure. Right now, for the next 18 months, we're looking at an MBS item for level C and D. Yeah. Nothing changes. Triple block bill incentive for telehealth. Nothing changes. Um, aged care SIP PIP combination that Simon was talking about, right? Three hundred dollars to the GP, one hundred and thirty dollars to the red, to the practice. The money goes to the GP, the other money goes to the practice. Yeah. According to current infrastructure. Yeah. Um, Two thousand dollars a year for the first year for um, frequent flyers. Remember the small population, but it will be two thousand dollars in a split. So our recommendations to government is when you give incentives tied to registration, when I say our, particularly mine, yep. my, my recommendation is to protect the business structure and not make it complicated. Whenever you give money in terms of an incentive for a registered patient, make sure some goes to GP, some goes to the practice, in current form. So nothing changes. Right. And, and then chronic disease items in November 24, Nothing changes. So if there's a GP who's got a particular set of skills that attracts a particular type of funding, is that GP to be incentivized for providing that service because the practice is now gaining a particular type of funding because of that GP? <coughs> if you're talking about the PIP and, other, and the WIP, that's up to the practice and the GP to sort it out, nothing changes from current mechanisms. I see a future though where, and, and this may or may not happen, but this is the future I see. We have, just like the aged care, you've got extra funding on top. Frequent flock hospital, aged care. Kids, look at the return on investment in children for continuity of care, $3.24. Maybe under fives can be, can be incentivized. When we're talking about incentives, we talk about on top of the MBS in different forms of block or blended funding. And as I've just said, the advice to government is whenever you do that, you split it, some to the GP, some to the practice. Whether they follow that advice, any time will tell. Okay. Um, sorry, my final question is, um, I'd like to address the elephant in the room. I think everyone's mind is on payroll tax at the moment. And um, a lot of information regarding payroll tax is coming in drips and drabs. And people have been talking about the practice entity fading into the background, and you being a service provider, uh, but in the background, and it's the, it's, the, it's the GPs who come into the forefront as being individual practice providers. So how does this block funding relate to that? Because if you're saying that the practices are registering patients, the practice is a genuine entity. And does that then you know, make sure and tell, tell us that we have to pay payroll tax irrespective of everything? Thank you. So again, this is my 20 cents worth. You know, I don't know the answer to that question other than say the following. So as a GP practice, as a GP practice owner, I, I say this, we are all in the same boat, right? The idea that we have to go as far as having separate websites for each individual doctor to advertise our services individually is absolutely ridiculous. It is anti-teamwork, it is anti-good quality care, and it's simply not safe. The idea that we practice individually as a lone ranger and don't rely on the rest of the practice to support us is absolutely ridiculous. So payroll tax is a result of the business structure of general practice and only two things are gonna happen in my view. This is my view. The first is what I hope for and that there will be a political solution at a national level to say that Everything we're trying to do is the payroll tax issue goes completely against it. So let's find a solution. Or 
we're all up for payroll tax and the entire business structure of general practice has to change. We're done. So the idea that we're an individual entity for the care of patients, remember this is about the patients. I've just shown you statistically public data that shows that continuity of care in a practice, not with an individual, makes a difference. And with a team, with relationship. Isn't that what I want? That's what I get out of bed to do in the morning. Thank you. And just to let people know that we did get a few other um, pre-asked questions on the payroll tax. Um, it is obviously something that's a little bit outside the scope of this evening's conversation, but it's something that the PHN is watching very closely. And as more information becomes available and there's more authoritative statements, we'll be definitely making that available to the broader general practice community. I can, oh, if I can add one thing, that's one of the reasons why our recommendation is to pay some to the doctor, same to the practice. Follow the, follow the money pathways, right? Um, so New South Wales apparently published its own ruling on the 11th of August. They're going full ball, full ball. And I read that and highlighted it today on the way up here. I can tell you that every single general practice in the state is doomed, right? Every single one. The only, and I'm not a lawyer, so please don't take my advice, even though I pretend to be. Uh, the only saving grace from that perspective is that the rulings that I've seen, particularly in New South Wales, says that it's the flow of money from the practice bank account to the GP. That money, the money that goes that way, is subject to payroll tax. Money that goes that way is not. That's all I can say. Get your own advice because I don't know what the solution is. Anthea, did you want to add something there? That's exactly right. There's lots of information there. We are trusting what we're reading in the media and that's always a very dangerous thing. So you need individual practice advice. But more seriously, as Dr said, this will be most likely met with a political solution. If we really want to be proactive, you make that appointment with your federal local member, you make that appointment with your state local member and you go and tell them that if they want general practice to die, please continue like this. If you want general practice to thrive, please do something about it now so that we can put that to bed and get on with this good stuff. Mm. And that's going to be the only way is that pay power of people talking to government at the very local level. My two bobs worth, sorry. No, no, that's fine. Thank you, Anthea. Okay, um, another sorry. question over here? Yeah. No, I just wanted to say about payroll tax. Go see your accountants. Um, don't rely on the media. Yep. Um, and it's a state-based tax. It's not federal. And it's, in, it's not income, it's wages. So it depends on how you pay your GPs, what your structure is, as to whether or not you are eligible to be taxed. So it's your staff and you've got a threshold of 1.3 million. So you need to talk to your accountants and um, see exactly how you structure your business. From your perspective, what do consumers think is the most important sell for a practice? So say for me, um, I have a big paediatric cohort that I see, they come to see me for complex care needs and I care plan them. But if I'm not working on a Wednesday and they've got a cough and cold, they've ducked around the corner somewhere close to them to see a GP and they might see them a number of times over winter. So when we're looking at, you know, registering these patients, as a consumer, what advice do you have for us as general practitioners about what's most important to consumers? I think um, a patient really wants to feel valued and, val and valuable to a practice. So I think that coffee sign you said um, that you showed on that slide, when you come into a practice, you want to be welcomed by the receptionist, you want to be welcomed um, by the doctor, you really want the doctor to remember your name, even if they've looked on the computer screen before you walk in the door. Um, but I think, you know, patients really do want, you know, 
continuity of care and they just want to feel loved. So your GP isn't available um, and you do go to the other GP, uh, you will probably go back to your original GP if you feel that you've been a valued patient and given time and spoken to. I think time is really important. Um, from a patient's perspective, I would prefer to pay a little bit more um, money if it meant I had a longer appointment if it was needed. You know, I want the, the, the GP to listen to me and hear me. I think that's, that's you know, really important. Um, and I actually don't mind if my GP's running late because I feel that if she's given time to a previous patient, she'll probably give time to me. So, um, but I think just remembering patients and remembering names is really, really important. Yep, we might just take one more from the floor. Let's ask me, will there be enough promotion for the patients that this one, beyond the practice, from national level or media, that's my medical, how do they do it? Patient will have awareness that it's coming. So because what happened uh, before, patient, a lot of time, patient wasn't aware of that. They have given consent for health assessment care plan. When patient can, oh, I didn't know that I had a care plan done. The consent was taken because patient awareness wasn't there. So will there be enough awareness made for the patients, not from practice, from the government, federal level, media, everywhere? Uh, I hope so. Um, <coughs> look, bearing in mind too that it's, uh, look, uh, I don't know. I don't think it's going to be a blasted campaign to encourage everybody to go and register on 1 October, right? That's going to overwhelm everybody, including us. So it's a balance between doing this slowly and methodically and learning as we go. I can absolutely assure you that that is the goal. It's to lay the foundations and learn as we go. And I'm quoting the minister wh what he said publicly as well as privately. This is not a hurry, but they want everybody to be part of it and to learn as we go. It's laying their foundation. Having said that, as I just said, how long you wait is entirely up to you. As momentum builds, there will be, I imagine, more and more campaigns and there'll be more education. But right now it is centred around general practice, about our role in the education of patients on this. But as Simon pointed out earlier, there will be lots of resources developed, which are developing now with the consumers and consumer health forums. Certainly that's something we've asked for at a board level and the CEOs nationally have asked for that. Um, so we're hoping that we will see those consumer packs and the consumer media information coming out soon so we know what it looks like, we know how it's going to feel, how we're going to work with it. I would call out the practice support team at the PHN. It's Bev here. Yeah. Bev. <laughs> um, Bev. <laughs> Bev leads the practice support team at Gold Coast PHN. And if you don't know who your practice support officer is, go see Bev afterwards and she'll tell you. Um, but it's a fantastic resource. You can ring up and ask so many questions from your practice support people and they will have a CQI kit ready to roll by 1st of October. If it's not nationally created, we'll create it here. Is that a fair enough guarantee? Yeah. Okay, just a couple of final questions. One from the front. wonderful to have that vision, um, but there's a problem with it, I see. There's been an, yeah, well, there's several, but there's been a big erosion of trust um, in government by GPs over the last decade. As we all know, with freezing of Medicare rebates and then failure of indexation of those rebates, etc. So I think our ability to take on a, a new project where their details are very, very minimal, we don't know, we're expected to sign up to this all and, and believe in, in rainbows and unicorns, essentially. And, and, and wish all the best for the future. And I think we're cynical enough, especially after COVID with a PPE disaster, with not being considered frontline 
for immunization, etc. That we're all a bit jaded, I know I am, and I know colleagues of mine are. So that's my comment. But my question is, you mentioned all these um, rebates, tri uh, bulk billing, triple incentives, and you know the $2,000 to keep somebody out of hospital. Sounds wonderful. Will they, what, what guarantee do we have that they, those payments are going to be indexed to inflation? Or are we going to be in 10 years' time in the same position we're in now where we sign up to this and we're all struggling again going, it's not enough because we all know what the story is here, don't we? Yeah, so that's my question. Is there going to be any guarantee that these payments will be indexed to inflation, to the reality of inflation, so that we can actually keep up with costs if this were to occur and we all signed up and got basically sidelined into it? Um, I hear you. I hear you. Um, <coughs> I, I suppose I'm, I bring a different lens, having um, the privilege of being involved for so many years in discussions about this. The idea of registration is not new. It's been talked about for about 15 years. And without it, I can tell you now nothing else is going to happen. And that's because that's that's the, that's the value of it, right? The value of that relationship, and and registration is so important in a, any health system. We're the only OECD country in the world that doesn't have it, right? So at a system level, you can look at it and go, well, that's a bit silly. Why don't we have that? How about we develop an Australian model of registration, not the NHS? I hear you about the trust thing. Completely agree with you. Hence, it is a stepwise learning foundational piece of work that will happen over time. I have no idea what the government's going to do in the future, but I know that as long as they want me to be involved, I'm going to be involved to help them. Um, why? Because I think that's the only thing, way that we can actually prove our worth and make a difference. Right? Um, I hear you about the trust. Um, one thing that the minister has said publicly, and all I can think about is I'm trying to quote what I've heard in the public domain, at the press conference, at the press club, at the week before an election. And it goes to the previous government as well, and the one before that. No government is going to continue pouring money into Medicare as is. Because all that rewards is an outdated system of funding that rewards volume over value each and every single time. The more patients you see, the more billable items you bill, the more you earn, and there is no direct link to quality, none whatsoever. So that's what the minister said. We're going to have to change the Medicare system, and this is the way that is foreshadowed to happen. It fits into the 10-year plan of the previous government, and it fits into the Strengthening Medicare Task Force recommendations. I would say in answer to your first part, this PHN was the only PHN in the country to provide masks to GPs initially when they weren't available, when there was zero stock in Australia. As a GP-led board with 50% or just under, yeah, 50% of the board GPs, we are really GP-focused and general practice-focused and patient-focused. And so our vision and notion to driving this forward is around patient care, around looking after the providers, the quintuplet aim. And all we can do is continue to share that vision, enable it with tips and tricks, enable it with data sharing, enable it with primary sense as a tool to help and to make it easy, um, and to invite any GP in the room to join the committees that are advertised. GPGC is often asking for GPs to join committees in the hospital for clinical handover. Um, Stacey's on the clinical handover team for the hospital health service to drive that improved clinical handover. GPGC may be looking for board members later in the year, join and have your voice. There's often committee positions on the practice improvement committee. So yeah, come along and, and help us on this journey and shape general practice. I want a general practice where I've got GPs to look after me when I'm old. I don't want to be a dinosaur that used to exist and that we go to the American system we saw how good the American system was during the pandemic at managing the pandemic, and it sucked, you know? We are way better off in this country and even the UK than America. Okay, Anthea. And, and well, it all ties in exactly what the last 
few speakers have been um, talking about ties into my question and my comment. For the last 20 years, I've worked in general practice on the Gold Coast for over 30 years, but at least for the last 20 years, we've worked very collaboratively. We, work, we learn from each other, we share, we go to meetings together. You're all here tonight. And that's because there is enough work to do it properly for the patients of the Gold Coast. Like you turn around and there's a new suburb. Like it just grows and grows and grows. And I know, I hear us say there's not enough doctors, even though we've got a very high patient to doctor ratio actually on the Gold Coast. It's about getting that access. But in working together, I think the fear is, is that my patient will be poached by another practice. That the one that comes to me very, very regularly will actually um, be shared amongst the four neighbouring practices in my suburb. So why are they going to choose me and how am I going to stop my neighbouring practice getting to them first? And I'd just like to know if there's any comments around um, whether there's any provisions for stopping that um, we all say mass marketing by large corporations or any other scary things. But if there's not, I just like to say to everybody, honestly, have faith in the service that you provide. You are really, really good GPs. We do it really well on the Gold Coast. And so we can continue to do that. And just again, focusing on the patients. I've always said, if you actually do the work really, really well, everything else eventually does take care of itself. But, uh, Doctor, is there any, any mechanism in the system to protect that? As if I have the, all the answers. Um, no, I, I don't know. I, I don't. When we were talking about, I mean, I suppose we've got to be careful about not revealing in confidence committee discussions, but remember, this, did, this was not invented overnight, right? Um, as um, Simon pointed out earlier, um, we talked about it for years, so during the 10 year plan development, we're talking two years of meetings, 20 consultations, 20 meetings, hundreds of organisations, hundreds of conversations. We nutted out all the issues in terms of how this should work in an Australian context, in the Medicare context. Um, the previous government invested 60 odd million dollars into the Service Australia system to get this ready. This system's been developed now for the last two years. It's now ready. I'm sure it's not perfect. I'll guarantee you it's not perfect. But it's now, it's now ready. So this is not something new. Um, when we were talking about it, 10 year plan development, the last thing, I mean if you think about the, f so there's a balance between consumers feeling that, but that that they've been restricted, right? The universality of Medicare is is a real image for consumers that it's universal. So you can't we can't restrict consumers. That's why a registered patient can still go anywhere they want. Um, that's the clear message when we're developing ten year plans. That's the thing that will protect us against the NHS system, right? It's the public. And so, but it's a balance between that and then allowing free reign where they can literally register in 365 practices, 365 different days of the year. That's mayhem. That's completely opposite of what the system's trying to achieve. I don't think that's gonna happen. So right now, there is no restriction on changing practices for that purpose. Perhaps in the future, it would be a good idea. Well, we'll have to wait and see. Thank you. And look, thank you to our panel. Um, it's been a really interesting uh, conversation and thanks to everyone with, for the questions from the floor. We are running out of time, so we're just going to quickly um, move on. So obviously it's a long journey um, and we're only at the start of it. There is a lot of uh, things to happen on this My Medicare journey, but uh, luckily, GCPHN is here to support. So I'm just going to hand over to Sharon uh, to talk about what practical support the PHN can be providing to general practice. Thank you. So um, those that don't know me, my name's Sharon Pepper. I'm the program coordinator for engagement and digital health. Hopefully you all do know um, by now that we have a practice support helpline and an email inbox. 
it's manned from 8am to 5pm Monday to Friday um, with a view to extending these hours to meet your needs um, should we need to. As Lisa mentioned earlier, our engagement and digital health team has been expanded to provide some dedicated support, including practice visits if required. Um, you will be contacted over the coming weeks by your dedicated um, team member, so you will know who's allocated to your practice. In the meantime, we have <laughs> two I prepared earlier. <laughs> so this is Deb Barnes and Caroline Gillies. Um, they're going to drop some forms on the table that you can complete now or you can scan the barcode and it will take you to an online form and that's just if you'd like us to contact you earlier rather than later. Um, but you can contact the um, practice support anytime. So the other assistance that we w can provide is let us know if you require support across any of the steps to have your organisation register um, set up. I think Waleed mentioned it can be a little tricky. <laughs> Bits, um, you know, setting up your organisation proto and linking it to HPOS and so forth. Um, so do urge you to get that done as soon as you can because sometimes there are issues with the Australian Business Registry that can take um, a month or so to iron out. So, as mentioned as well, soon there'll be the My Medicare specific quality improvement toolkits available um, to provide those practi practical step-by-step -step guides um, to support general practice to implement quality improvement activities around the voluntary patient enrolment. Um, as well as a expression of interest later in the year for a facilitated CQI activity. Um, there is a link on the slides that you can see um, the other toolkits as well. And there'll also be an expression of interest um, after the 1st of October for a voluntary patient registration clinical audit um, development. Just urge you, if you're a practice manager or practice nurse, please make sure you've sub subscribed to the um, email network group as it's not only just a good communication tool between practices, um, it's a way for us to share any targeted information to you. If you're not sure if you're subscribed, please contact us as well and we can help you out with that. And last but not least, it's never been more important to ensure you are subscribed to our newsletter, GP and Practice News. Comes out every Wednesday and we'll keep you informed of all the relevant news and information. That's it for me. Okay. So we were going to do a final question on the Mentimeter, but it, as it didn't work, we won't do that. But just, again, by a show of hands, we're just wanting to know what the best methods of communication are, particularly around this topic. So just hands up if you want, want to receive information this way. Um, through the GPMP News and the email networks, people happy to receive that? Okay, it's most people. Online webinars at key points in the journey, about half. Face-to-face -face meetings such as this one, probably a little bit more than half. On-site practice visits, yeah, about three quarters. And any other ideas? Is there something we're not doing that you think we should be? If you do have thoughts, you can always get in contact with the practice support um, email list and uh, email address and give us uh, your ideas, but just reach out if you require support or help. Okay, so um, that's it for this evening. Thank you everyone for your time. It was really good to have uh, a lot of interest from our general practices. Thanks once again to all our panel members and in particular to uh, Wally Jamal who's come up from Sydney to address us tonight. So thank you everybody and make sure that you've got the contact details.